Hello and welcome to the webinar series from IRIS. This webinar is entitled How to Create an Effective and Safety Compliant Electrical Maintenance Program. My name is Rudy Woodridge. I'm the Vice President of Engineering Services here at IRIS based in Florida. We all know that electrical systems are critical to our manufacturing and commercial buildings. Any error or disruption in these systems can have a huge impact. What for you is the dependence on electrical energy and control systems? And what are the consequences of an unplanned mishap in your electrical systems? How long will it take you to recover from an unplanned outage? How are you going to improve your electrical distribution systems reliability? These are all important questions that hopefully this webinar will provide you with a little bit of insight into how to answer. An electrical maintenance program is a schedule of regularly planned maintenance testing and corrective actions with the intent of preventing failures of critical assets. An effective electrical maintenance program will find faulty components before they can actually fail, as well as assess the useful life of existing assets. It assures optimal working conditions and conserves the life of the equipment. It can help you provide improved energy utilization and efficiency on time delivery to your customers, ensure environmental or regulatory compliance, maintain employee safety, improve raw material utilization and reduce waste, improve first pass yield of your manufacturing operation, and overall improve uptime. All of this depends on reliable incident-free operation of your electrical systems, but it can be achieved. So much has been written on the why and the what of electrical maintenance programs, but how can you start at your facility? We recommend performing a criticality analysis using a failure modes and effects tool set in order to determine where you should be spending the bulk of your energy to maximize reliability of your electrical infrastructure. The FMEA process is well documented and leads to calculating a risk priority number of your critical assets, then taking preventative steps to mitigate the risk on the highest priorities, and then recalculating the RPN and deciding if it's necessary to continue to take additional corrective actions. The process is relatively simple, but is tailored to every individual facility. You assemble a cross-functional team. You look at the critical pieces of the electrical and electromechanical infrastructure. You list the possible modes of failure, the ways in which things can fail, and what the impact of a failure on each piece of equipment would be. You go through a ranking and severity exercise where you think about how this would impact the overall facility. Would it cause 10% of the facility to be impacted? Would it cause 100% of the facility to be impacted? What are the safety implications of a failure of a particular piece of equipment? What are the environmental implications? Would it cause a discharge of untreated wastewater, for instance? All of these things go into a rank severity exercise in that RPN process. You then look at the potential causes of failure and rank the likelihood of those causes of failure. And then you start thinking about process controls, ways and means by which you could prevent those failures from occurring or detect early warning signs of impending failure and then take corrective action. So the FMEA process, again, it's well documented. There are lots of good examples out there about how to do it. Uh, and it helps you calculate this RPN number. And then you can make better decisions about where you should be investing your time and energy on the most critical assets that have the biggest impact if they were to fail. And then think about, again, what means could be used to prevent and predict possible failure and take corrective action in a more timely fashion. When it comes to these detection technologies, we like to think of it in terms of uh, critical asset surveillance. So in critical asset surveillance is, is basically any technology uh, that is utilizing condition-based monitoring and can be used every day to inspect our electrical distribution assets. These surveillance methods then determine the condition of the individual asset or system being inspected and can include but aren't limited to infrared thermography, 
airborne ultrasound, contact ultrasound, motor current analysis, partial discharge testing, corona cameras, uh, online monitoring systems, and of course visual inspections as well. So airborne ultrasound can detect arcing and tracking, as well as corona. Contact ultrasound can be used on transformers to detect loose windings, loose bolted connections, and a number of other things. Motor current analysis, obviously as the name implies, detects various types of problems in motors on the rotor, stator faults, winding faults. All of these can be detected by looking at the current and voltage signature uh, of, a, of a motor. Infrared cameras detect hot spots, loose electrical connections that will eventually cause full functional failures. Ultraviolet cameras can also be used to detect corona in medium and high voltage equipment. Visual inspection is always important, as well as checking for audible noises, vibration, dirt, dust, uh, rodent ingress into equipment. All of these things are critical. We should always be using our senses as well as some of these technology tools when assessing equipment condition. And then finally, electrical maintenance safety devices can be used to perform multiple types of inspections, but while keeping the equipment safely closed and in a guarded state. When we look at electrical distribution infrastructure specifically, Traditional electrical inspections commonly only look at the bolted connections within the switchgear as these are generally considered to be the weakest points or points most likely to fail. These may include cable connections, so that's crimped lugs, screw and saddle clamp, booted connections and cable to bus bar connections. Bus bar connections themselves, so splices, shipping splits, transition sections, isolators, so disconnects or circuit breakers, and it's important to scan both the connection but also the device themselves that have internal components that could overheat if defective. These are all certainly important components to inspect, but there may be other hidden problems that are less obvious as well. Let's look at a typical electrical connection and the possible modes of failure and how each technology can be utilized. Infrared can be utilized to look for hot spots. Ultrasound, again, for arcing and tracking. Partial discharge is a de detection is a slightly different technology. You can also say that arcing and tracking are partial discharge events, but when I refer to partial discharge here, I'm talking about transient earth voltage detection, which is different and where we're looking for actual defects in cable insulation or other insulating components, typically in 5, 5 kV and higher rated equipment. Motor current analysis, ultraviolet scans, and visual inspections. If I have a good electrical connection, I won't find anything with any of these tools. However, if there is a defect, I will find something with at least one of these tools, if not more than one. For instance, we could have an overloaded electrical connection and circuit. We will see that as excessive heating when we perform our infrared scan. We might also visually see some signs of physical changes to the cable insulator or the, or the conductor materials themselves. All of that is possible on an overloaded connection. And of course, we could qualify that in fact it is an overloaded connection by taking some power or power quality measurements on that circuit. If I have a high resistance or loose electrical connection, I would likely see localized heating with my infrared scan. I might find early signs of ultrasound with some little tracking events that are going on inside that connection. Unlikely that I would see anything with partial discharge. With motor current analysis, if in fact this, uh, this connection was feeding a motor load, I might start to see some elevated resistance in the readings on my tested circuits. I would not see anything with ultraviolet, and again, with visual, I might see some, uh, some early signs of heating on the cables or on the conductors themselves. If it was a high resistance in the cable lug, we would see the localized heating more evident at the lug connection than at the bolted connection. But otherwise, the, si the signature items that we would be detecting would be very similar to a loose bolted connection. If the problem was in fact a partial discharge event going on inside the cable insulation, that would be picked up via our transient earth voltage detection. 
Reliability-centered maintenance curves are the age reliability behavior curves which graph the conditional probability of failure of a piece of equipment versus its age. The failure patterns illustrate failure probability against time and can be split broadly into two categories, age-related failures and random failures. And what's important to note here is that non-age-related failures, or random failures as they're also known, account for almost 90% of the failures which occur in equipment. And the reason that we reinforce this is that it just, it, it, it really uh, drives home the point that it is of value to be performing condition-based maintenance inspections of your equipment from the time they are commissioned right through the time that they are decommissioned some 25, 30, 40 years later. Because these non-age related failures can happen at any time and you know it's not just in the last five years of nominal life that you should start paying attention to maintaining your equipment. You should really be doing it from the time that you first purchase it right through its entire lifespan. The PF curve, or probability, uh, problem failure curve, can be used to understand the failure of electrical assets over time. Point P on the curve is the time at which something has physically changed in the equipment that, if it's left unattended to, will eventually lead to full functional failure, which is point F on the curve. That could be days, months, or even years that pass before the functional failure happens, depending on the nature of the defect. And all along this curve, different inspection techniques can detect the early warning signs and help determine the severity of the issue so that corrective action can be taken. A good analogy is when you're driving your car and you hear an unusual engine knock. That could be one of many things, and your local mechanic might need to hook up the car to a diagnostic computer to help assess the problem. If you ignore the noise and keep driving the car, the knock might get more and more noticeable. You might start seeing black smoke come from the exhaust, and eventually the engine could stop running altogether. Now, going to the mechanic today would be much less expensive than doing so when the actual full engine failure has occurred. And it's much the same with electrical equipment. Taking care of a problem today when you detect the problem early is going to be much less expensive than letting that, that problem uh, fester and become a much bigger problem some months or years from now. So the longer one waits, the more expensive it is to repair the equipment back to pristine condition. So then the real value of critical asset surveillance is to detect, to detect those potentially expensive problems early and then take the lowest cost corrective action. This can both extend the asset's life, but also avoid unexpected electrical system failures that can have costly consequences related to both repair or replacement costs, but also process downtime. Any assessment of the use of CAST technology should involve understanding both the cost of implementation, but also the consequences of equipment failure, including economic and non-economic factors. Non-economic factors can include the impacts to worker morale, the environment, and the company's reputation. IEEE recently published a study summarizing the use of preventative maintenance programs like CAST and how they can reduce the cost to perform repairs on different types of electrical infrastructure assets. The average cost reduction when using a CAST or PM type program was 66%. The way to think about this is in terms of if you had to replace the asset outright, that's the outside of the spider web plot. The average repair cost is the area in blue without a PM program in place. The average repair cost with a PM program in place is the much smaller purple area. Well, what about energy efficiency? Well, it turns out that loose electrical connections also cost you money. They are generating losses because of the high resistance of the connection, and that, is, that loss goes out into the, into the system in the form of heat. Now you can do calculations by measuring the resistance across a connection, a loose connection versus a normal tight connection and calculate what the actual uh, watts loss is on a particular loose connection. And then based on how many hours per day and days per year you are running that particular piece of, of process equipment, you can calculate the kilowatt hour loss and then multiply that times your cost of electricity. So, you know, on this particular 
uh, connection here where we've done the calculations and it works out to about $300 per year in operating energy loss costs for one loose electrical connection, one phase of one device drawing about 250 amps of load current. What about the human factor? When you're seeking to protect your personnel and assets, you've got to remember the following. Human error is both universal and inevitable. Everyone makes mistakes. It's not about morality. People don't come to work intending to make a mistake. They don't do it intentionally. It just happens. And errors aren't always intrinsically bad things. Sometimes we learn more from the mistakes that we make than we do from having an easy time of being successful. Both success and failure spring from the same root. And we are error-guided creatures. Errors mark the boundaries of the path to success. And we can't change that human nature. We can't change the fact that we make mistakes. But you can change the conditions in which humans work. All right? There are always two parts to a, a, an error. One is your mental state. All right? You could be distracted. You could be... Um, you know, have not had enough sleep the night before. There's all kinds of things that can contribute to a mental state that then becomes a possibility for an error. But there's a second part to an error, the situation that you were put into, the work situation, the environment in which you're operating, the task that you're being asked to perform. We have very limited control over people's mental states, but we can, as managers, as engineers, as designers, design and control the situations in which people are asked to perform tasks. The best people can make the very worst mistakes, and no one is immune to error. If only inexperienced people had made mistakes, it would be simple to make sure that they are not involved in the complex task, right? That would make our lives simple. But even the most experienced people can make an error and can be involved in, in an accident which can result in serious property damage or even the loss of human life. So how do we design tasks when it comes to maintenance and these inspection uh, processes, condition inspections, how can we design processes in such a way that we can eliminate the risk of human error? This becomes a very interesting task for us to undertake and it should always be part of what we're thinking about when we are uh, designing and thinking about how to improve the reliability of our infrastructure. We want to reduce the possibility of an error because of our people. Reduce what we call maintenance-induced failures. All right, And it's, it's been shown that more than half of the maintenance errors are recognized as having happened before. We're repeating the same errors. We're doing the same things over and over again. The key is trying to design these errors out of any system that we implement when it comes to maintenance. You may be thinking, what, what does this have to do with electrical equipment? You've gone off on a bit of a strange tangent here. But the reality is that we interact with our electrical equipment in a number of different ways. And a lot of these ways that we have done it traditionally are hazardous, right? We create an arc flash hazard every time we open or close an equipment door, every time we remove or replace a cover on a piece of equipment, every time we reach into, lean into, point into a piece of equipment. If we open a piece of equipment and we find that they've placed internal touch-proof barriers, those are great, except that if I'm doing a condition maintenance task, and I'm using an infrared camera, I then have to remove that barrier in order to use my camera. I can't do infrared through a clear plastic barrier inside a piece of switch gear. So that is actually, although it was designed with the intent of making it safer, when it comes to doing condition maintenance, it's actually made it more hazardous for the person doing the task. Every time we operate a switch, operate a circuit breaker, rack a circuit breaker, all of these are opportunities for us to have and to make an error and to have an accident. And using tools and test equipment. Unfortunately, some of the worst accidents that I've ever I've ever seen were done by people who were highly experienced and made a mistake, and they used the wrong piece of test equipment on the wrong voltage uh, of system that they were doing troubleshooting on. Um, these are the kinds of problems that we have. These are the problems that we want to eliminate with the use of electrical safety devices. 
So what are the types of electrical maintenance safety devices? Broadly, there are sort of three categories that we talk about. One are infrared windows. These can be round, they can be rectangular, they come in standard sizes, they can also be custom designed, custom replacement panels where there's a window built in. They allow infrared inspection, ultraviolet light inspection with a UV camera, as well as visual inspection. All right, so they allow you to use your senses your sense of, of, of sight, but also to look in the spectrums that you, with your human eye, cannot detect, infrared and ultraviolet. The second category is what we broadly refer to as ports. These are ways to listen into the equipment or to tap into the equipment, but in a safe manner. So this includes ultrasound ports and sensors, external voltage in indicators, which tell you that the equipment is still energized or that it has been de-energized. Usually they're part of a broader lockout tagout program. Motor current analysis ports, which are, are ports on motors, uh, called, sometimes called MTAPs, which allow you to get current and voltage readings without actually opening up uh, the cable compartment to the motor, but rather tapping into an existing test point. And similarly, power quality monitoring ports, which are sometimes installed on switch gear in order to allow you to get voltage and current data from the front of the cabinet rather than having to open the cabinet and use uh, you know, split core current transformers and alligator clips for voltage. So those are the those are different ports. Again, all all of these can be designed, specified into equipment. They can also be retrofit into existing equipment. And then the last category of electrical maintenance safety devices fall into the category of online monitoring. So this could be online power quality monitoring with permanently installed meters, software packages, communicating over ethernet or local area network, gathering data, logging that data, you know, looking at harmonics and power factor and all these other uh, phenomena that you, that you wanna understand and make sure that you're getting a, a relatively good uh, supply of power from your utility, but also that you're not polluting the grid uh, due to variable speed drives or other harmonic producing loads on your system. Partial discharge monitoring, more for utility uh, clients who are looking at partial discharge as a way to understand when they are uh, starting to have uh, issues with cable insulation, with insulator degradation. Vibration analysis used a lot on motors, compressors, any rotating equipment that you can very easily install. Uh, three axis vibration sensors that, that will convey data you know, either in a wired or wireless fashion back to some kind of data logger and software to analyze that data. Temperature monitoring. This could be on you know, some of your critical equipment where even a you know, monthly infrared inspection wouldn't be enough for you. You might think about installing permanent temperature monitoring uh, because that equipment, uh, you know, was designed very close to the to the tolerance that's, that's feasible for it. Um, so, you know, temperature monitoring may make sense on some of your most critical assets. And then lastly, something that maybe isn't quite as uh, intuitive as an online monitoring, but it's intelligent asset tags and monitoring. So these can be devices that allow you to uh, record uh, data directly on a tag that resides on the critical piece of equipment. It can also have information there for the maintenance person. So he touches the tag with a reader device, whether that's a phone or a specialized reader, and it gives him a bunch of information about the equipment he's standing in front of. It might tell him, here's where to find the maintenance records. Here's the drawings. Here's the you know normal parameters of operation for this equipment. It's all resident on the tag. And some of the these tags allow read-write capability so you can actually record new information. You could perform an inspection and record that information directly to the tag, and then the tag is linked uh, and networked essentially back uh, through a cloud database where all of the maintenance history on all of your equipment can be housed. A recent study on the effect of regular skilled preventative maintenance and remote monitoring of critical power system reliability by Emerson showed some very interesting results. The Emerson study was done specifically for data centers, but it, I think it's applicable for really any type of facility. And what they looked at was the mean time between failure or average time between equipment failures on all of the assets that they had under management at these data centers and what happened to that average time between failures if they increased the frequency of preventative maintenance visits. So they discovered that if they were doing 
no preventative maintenance visits and went to a single PM visit per year, they could get a 10 times increase in MTBF. If they went from an annual visit to a quarterly visit, so from one to four visits per year, they were still getting a 5.1x increase in MTBF. And this inherently makes sense. I mean, the more often that we go and check on our equipment and we use the tools, infrared, ultrasound, motor current, etc., to determine its condition, the more likely we are to find problems early in that PF curve and then take a decision to make corrective actions. Another important concept that is starting to become more and more widely adopted is the idea of total cost of asset ownership, which means not just the cost of acquiring the asset, those direct visible costs on the front end, which really only account for about 15% of the total asset ownership cost over its lifetime. That's that acquisition, research, design, construction. That's 15% of what you're going to spend on keeping that asset operational in its lifetime. The other 85% is all of the rest of it, the stuff under the water, the invisible part of the iceberg. It's operations, it's maintenance, testing, training, spare parts, inventory, software, all of that needs to be thought about during the design phase. What is it going to cost me to run this asset? How am I going to maintain this asset? So more and more, people are starting to think about that total cost of ownership, and they may, they may decide to take decisions to spend a little bit more on the direct cost in order to reduce the, uh, the uh, operating cost over that equipment's life. And again, this is where these electrical safety devices come in, because I can do my maintenance inspections in a much faster and safer manner with, an, with the electrical safety devices implemented as part of the design of the equipment. In addition, I'm going to find the problems earlier, which means I'll have a lower cost to fix the problems when they inevitably do occur. So which critical assets should you consider first for EMSD implementation, whether that's in new equipment or in retrofit situations? Let's go back to that first principle, that FMEA process. It drives the determination of risk priority. The assets whose failure would have the greatest impact from a downtime and cost to repair or replace become the priorities. In most facilities, this means the assets that would cause the broadest interruption in electrical service to the plant. So, medium voltage switchgear, main transformers, whether dry or oil type, oil filled type, the primary low voltage switchgear. These are the usual first points of deployment for EMSDs. The next tier are the pieces of process equipment or switchgear feeding process equipment that are critical to the plant's operation. This might include some low voltage secondary switchgear, switchboards, variable speed drives, large motor wire termination chambers. Often these devices uh, that, that if they failed, that would starve the production process of some key element causing a broader process interruption. The lowest priority is typically the third tier of low voltage distribution, including small power distribution panels, load centers, lighting panels, disconnect switches, and low horsepower motor control centers. These devices tend to not be paid very much attention uh, when it comes to implementing your initial EMSD and, and condition monitoring program. So to summarize, the use of an, an EMSD and critical asset surveillance technology program delivers a number of advantages for you. You will see lower repair cost exposure when using a CAST and PM program. You can have a significant impact on the total cost of ownership by reducing all those indirect costs, all that stuff under the iceberg associated with maintenance and spares and the time to perform even your condition maintenance inspections. You, you can see, when we've demonstrated this to multiple customers, that if you are currently doing open panel inspections on your equipment, infrared or ultrasound or otherwise, energized open panel inspections, you can see up to a 95% reduction in the man hours required to do those energized inspections by implementing electrical maintenance safety devices. I showed you the, uh, the uh, Emerson study that demonstrated how mean time between failure is significantly improved, adding to increased uptime and decreased downtime. Return on safety is something we are increasingly seeing show up 
on the annual reports of Fortune 500 companies. And in North America, or any companies that are North American based with international operations, there is the NFPA 70E document, which drives a safety conscious maintenance protocol where there's this concept called the hierarchy of control that tells you that you should be looking at designing safer methods of performing your maintenance tasks. And we have a separate webinar that talks just about the NFPA 70E and the hierarchy of control. And then last couple items, you can remove maintenance induced failures by simplifying the energized maintenance inspection processes. By keeping the equipment closed, guarded, you're not opening panels, you're not removing panels, you eliminate opportunities for human error. And that's huge, huge, hugely important. And then lastly, you can get a return on investment on your cast equipment and training. And we have tools that can show you how you can cost justify to the finance people the implementation of a condition maintenance program. So if you're interested in that, please contact us and we'll, we'll work with you closely and walk through that RPN process and walk through how to calculate what type of improvement in MTBF in, in annual failure rate you could expect to see on the different types of equipment in your facility. And with that, we'll open it up for some questions.